podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar. Before we get started, I just wanted to go over a couple of quick ground rules for today's presentation. All attendees have been placed on mute for this webinar, and if you do have any questions throughout, please feel free to put them in the questions tab in your GoToWebinar panel, and we will address questions uh, at the end as time permits. At this point, I would now like to hand it over to Brian Renstrom to begin today's presentation. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for taking the time to join us on um, our uh, PPP loan forgiveness webinar. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone uh, to the webinar. Uh, my name is Brian Renstrom. I'm the Master's Managing Partner for Boom Shapiro. I'm going to be joined today, uh, and who's actually giving the presentation, um, by my colleagues Mike LaCrosse, Eric Kennedy, Bill Moore, and Dave Fonts. And I appreciate them taking their time today to uh, to uh, execute on this webinar. So uh, the agenda today is uh, has three major components. One, uh, we wanted to walk you through and introduce you to a tool we've developed that um, many of our clients and, and folks who have used it uh, find very helpful in terms of helping to uh, um, calculate loan forgiveness and to also uh, use it as a documentation tool. Um, the second component of the agenda today is we'd like to go through some scenarios um, that will help you uh, think through some strategies as it relates to planning uh, for loan forgiveness um, because the rules uh, are tricky in that regard and we'd like to go through some examples that I think will give you some good insight uh, for your planning purposes. And then third, we're gonna, we've, uh, we've gotten some questions uh, from folks who have signed up and there's an opportunity to uh, put in questions during the webinar. We'll take as many of those as we can. Uh, we have an hour today. Um, we'll be very respectful of your time uh, and we'll end sharply at 11. So without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Mike LaCrosse. Good morning, everyone. Uh, as you can note on page four uh, is our disclaimer. Uh, I won't read through the whole thing, but please be aware that the final guidance from the SBA has not been given and things are very fluid at this point. We will be presenting you an overview based on our current understanding of the PPP program and the loan process. Great. So um, going to page six, uh, the Paycheck Protection Program Overview. Um, I won't go through this in, uh, in a lot of detail as this has been out for some time and hopefully this is old news for most of you that are on the phone today. Uh, I think we'll spend more time on the content uh, later in the deck. So overview of the program, the, the funds are intended to uh, be used for small businesses to retain workers. It will cover rent, mortgage interest, and interest payments that are impacted by COVID-19. The key word here is impacted. Examples of how businesses have been impacted could be uh, interruption supply chain, lead times, shipments, quality, staffing, uh, declines in revenue or customers. The loans can be used for any business concern, nonprofit, veteran, or tribal business. The loan covers expenses from February 15th through June 30th. And you know, the most important part here is the loan can be forgiven, assuming that it's used for payroll interest payments. The maximum loan amount um, can be up to 10 million, but it's the lesser of the amount of your average total monthly payroll times 2.5. Additional key points to the Paycheck Protection Program are that the businesses must be less than 500 employees. There are some exceptions to this in the food services sector, um, as well as under NAI CS Code 72, which includes hotels and restaurants. Also, there's uh, some exceptions around franchises. The term employee includes employees that are full-time or part-time. Volunteers are not considered employees. Uh, principal residents must be in the U.S. and uh, the the employees with compensation that are greater than $100,000 on an annual basis are The other thing that's important to understand is the affiliation rules. If you are, uh, if you are a private equity or venture capital backed company, this could impact you. I, I'd reach out to your attorney and discuss the affiliation rules um, if this impacts you. Other key points of the Paycheck Protection Program are that it includes sole proprietors and independent contractors. The loan proceeds, uh, as we've talked about before, may be used for uh, payroll, health care, employee salaries, commissions, mortgage interest, rent, utilities, and interest in other debt. And, and the loan itself, uh, the interest is capped at 1% and is max maturity of two years. 
It can be deferred up to six months, and there are no fees, personal guarantees, and collateral needed. All terms of a loan will be the same for each business that receives the PPB loan. Please remember the key points here are that the PPB loan uh, can be forgiven if you use it on the loan proceeds, payroll, rents, utilities, interest payments, and we'll talk about that, more about that in a few minutes. Uh, for all details around the Paycheck Protection Program, please visit treasury.gov. The link here is uh, in our presentation. So one thing that's been very helpful for the folks that we've talked to prior to this webinar is given a, an example. So I'm going to go through a quick example of how the, the process should work. It's a very simple example, and obviously it can get more complex uh, for, for different businesses. But if Business X applies for Paycheck Protection Program and has $120,000 of payroll costs uh, in the last year, it's a monthly average of $10,000. So we'll go back to what I said a minute ago to calculate how much the loan could be. In this case, it'd be that 10,000 times 2.5 or $25,000. This, this company would not get over 10 million. Now let's talk about the, the loan forgiveness. And again, we're gonna show you a more complex calculator here in a few minutes. Um, if in the first eight weeks of the business, uh, after the business borrows the 25,000, the business pays $20,000 related to payroll, mortgage interest, and utility payments, $5,000 of that will, will uh, turn into a loan. $20,000 will be forgiven. $5,000 will be turned into a loan. And any payments will not be due for six months. Please note that interest is accruing monthly. At this time. So uh, just some details around the Paycheck Protection Program. Um, you know, it was released in uh, end of March and it was $349 billion in total. As of April 16th, all of that money was used up. Round two opened up with an additional $320 billion on April 27th. And as of May 10th, uh, $190 billion has already been used. Round two has the same rules and protocols as round one in terms of the loan forgiveness. So now I'll pass it off to Eric Kennedy, who will take you through the loan forgiveness and Bloom's calculator. Thanks, Michael. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna start working on the loan forgiveness. Um, on slide 13 here, um, you know, I, I think a lot of questions have uh, arisen from the loan forgiveness uh, lack of guidance. And I think that's something we'll get into uh, as we go forward through this presentation. Um, you know, I'll try to call out everywhere where, you know, whether there's an asterisk or not, where there's still open for interpretation. Um, as most people know, um, some people have already received funds up to four weeks ago. So, um, some of them are already halfway through and there's still limited guidance out there. So um, we're all eagerly awaiting uh, some further information. But um, for now, we want to go through what we know and um, go from there. So um, you know, I think the, the first thing is, you know, the eight week evaluation period begins once funds have been dispersed. Um, I think that's been a question by quite a few people. Um, the SBA has come out and, and reiterated that it is once, it, once funds have been dispersed, that's when the period begins. Um, you know, what, in, what is included in your loan forgiveness? Um, salaries and wages, interest on debt, um, you know, which would both be mortgage or, or anything that's secured by personal property, uh, rent and utilities. Uh, what does it exclude? Uh, payroll costs uh, on an annualized basis of greater than 100,000, compensation uh, to those who have principal residence outside of the U.S., um, any qualified family leave wages, uh, and any expenses related to interest, rent, or utilities that were signed into agreement after February 15th, 2020. Um, and then, you know, I think the, the big thing too here is the adjustments. Um, we'll, we'll go into the adjustments a little bit more detail on the calculator. Um, but, you know, the, 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 the big pieces are the reduction of FTEs, um, which the FTEs, uh, full-time equivalents, uh, you know, it's really defined uh, to the ACA, um, which is you know, 30 hours on average. And it's a full-time equivalent, so it doesn't obviously mean each person has to work 30 hours. It's, it's more of a pool of people. Um, as long as they work 30 hours, they would qualify as an FTE. Um, so one adjustment is you, um, you must bring your uh, FTEs back to a level, um, a covered period, they call it. Uh, if you don't bring it back to that level, you would get penalized. Um, whatever that percentage decrease would, would decrease your potential uh, loan forgiveness amount. 
Um, another adjustment would be reduction of, of employee wages. Um, we have uh, less than $100,000 of annualized, annualized salary. Um, and then the other reduction would be uh, non-payroll costs that are uh, greater, if they are greater than 25% of, of the total loan, um, there's a risk of reduction there. Um, they have provided some opportunities to um, make up for these adjustments. Um, one being if your FTEs at 630 are greater or equal to um, February 15th, 2020, even if you had a reduction during that eight-week period, um, this would then go down to zero. Um, the, the whole purpose there is also they want to make sure that uh, companies are rehiring back to the levels pre-COVID-19. Um, and then the other uh, opportunity is you, even if you reduce uh, salaries below that 25% uh, threshold for people below 100,000, um, there's an opportunity to make them whole by 6:30, 2020 as well, and you would not get penalized, even if you pay them less during that uh, eight-week covered period. Um, so now, you know, we're going to proceed into the loan forgiveness calculator. Um, our calculator, you know, unfortunately, we didn't put it on here, but uh, our it can it's it's downloadable on our website. Um, we'll, I think there's at the end there's a slide that shows the website to go to. Um, when on the coronavirus uh, Bloom Shapiro page, uh, there's a link there that says the the loan forgiveness toolkit. Um, you're definitely welcome to download, and I think um, it really helps people understand, um, you know, the current interpretations, and you know, at least play around with it. Uh, get an understanding of how it works, and then from there, um, you might have a little bit better understanding and, and some uh, better questions going from there. Um, so I'm going to walk everybody through the actual calculator itself, um, and uh, you know, we'll go from there. For everyone on the line, uh, just as a heads up, as we transition from this PowerPoint into the loan forgiveness calendar or calculator, your screen may go white just for a second as we make that transfer over to that. So uh, you are still connected to the webinar. Okay, I have to, um, well, I'll go over here. Perfect, Every, everyone should be able to see the calculator now. Thank you. All right. Perfect, great. Okay, so the calculator has four tabs. Um, the first tab is really just a disclosure, similar to what we have here in the webinar. Um, you know, I, I think the main point is, um, you know, this is our interpretation at the time, and it is subject to change. I think daily almost there's new guidance that comes out on the SBA's website that Michael had referenced before. Um, it seems like at this point, it's still referencing the actual program itself to um, obtain the loan. They have not, unfortunately, released too much on the loan forgiveness piece. So, um, again, this is our interpretation now, and uh, it is subject to change. And uh, as things change, we update the calculator and we, we try to uh, let everybody know of those changes uh, almost immediately. And uh, if you sign up to our mailing list, you would get those uh, emails pretty much, pretty much real time of when changes happen. Um, so moving forward with the calculator, um, the first tab is really your summary. It's, it's, it, it summarizes the entire calculator. Um, you know, the first step is, you know, what, what did you receive from the SBA? Um, so you didn't put that there. It's a manual input. Um, what we try to do is anything that's in blue uh, is, a, is a manual input. Anything that's in the gray or, or black, um, that's linked to another uh, worksheet or formula. Um, so it makes it a little relatively easier for your end user to to use. Um, so in the top portion is we put in the loan amount, and then we got to figure out okay, what amounts are going to be eligible for the forgiveness? You know, it's your payroll, it's your interest, it's your rent payments, and it's utility costs. Um, so if we kind of start from there and go down, we'll walk you through there. So first step is payroll. Payroll is quite. Uh, straightforward it goes we go to this loan forgiveness worksheet which is tab three um it's if you downloaded our forgiveness calculator or i'm sorry our uh, our uh, loan calculator this is set up very similar um where we're breaking down uh by category what is eligible for the um payroll amounts um just gotta be careful we, we try to call out here you know they have separate categories but some are if, if you already included bonuses in your top 
um, you know, in salaries and wages, you do not want to double count here. Um, we split it up by a week because uh, you have the eight-week period. Um, you obviously can you can choose to do it whatever way you feel best or more comfortable with. Um, not everybody wants to split it up by a week like this. Um, well, we try to do this so you can see, you know, because you're taking your average FTEs, which we'll use for a, a separate calculation up front, which is on the uh, reduction uh, piece. Um, but the eight weeks, it's here. Uh, people are somewhere on weekly, some are on biweekly. Um, you know, I think one of the first things to touch on, on on where the interpretation hasn't been super clear on is whether it's on a cash basis or accrual basis. Um, so if, if you're if you're dispersing that payroll uh, tomorrow, um, is that part of week one? Let's say you got your money yesterday and then you disperse payroll tomorrow. Is that um, is that whole biweekly or weekly payroll in arrears uh, included, or is it on a accrual basis where it's the future um, period after the disbursement? Uh, you know, that's that's still subject to, to change, but you know, I think you know everything is kind of cash basis at this point, um, but that could change. Uh, so you have all your separate categories here. You, you get your salaries, you get your health benefits, your premiums, you get your retirement benefits, um, which would conclude your, your match 401k and that type of stuff. State and local payroll tax, uh, typically unemployment. Um, if you live in Massachusetts, you have um, uh, the, the Pay Family Leave Act that you would also include there too. Um, what would not be included, similar to the loan amount, you would not include anything in excess of 100,000 uh, on an annualized basis. Um, you would not include anybody who has um, a principal residence outside of the U.S. and any qualified uh, family leave wages. Um, and that would summarize your total payroll. Then going down, you'd have your other costs here. You have your mortgage slash your debt on um, you know real property interest um, secured by real property. Sorry, uh, rent. Um, you know, rent is another area where I think a lot of people have questions on whether. It's rent on real property, um, such as uh, you know a, a building, or would it also include rent on equipment, uh, leases on equipment, that type of stuff. So I think we're still awaiting uh, that interpretation as well. Uh, utilities, uh, electric, oil, gas, water, um, telephone, internet. Uh, you know, I think if telephone, internet. People have said, hey, is, is cell phones included? Uh, I think generally that, that's the way people are going. Um, so that would then total up your total loan forgiveness. So between the payroll of 540 and the um, 210 thousand dollars of other non-payroll, that creates 750 thousand dollars of total forgiveness. If I go to um, a little further up, we have this in this orange cell. Um, there's a 75 percent, 25 percent threshold I mentioned on the, on the earlier slides. Um, you know, they're restricting that 75% of the uh, forgiveness amount must be related to payroll. Um, this, again, is another error for interpretation. Some people say, okay, is it 75% of the total original loan amount? Is it 75% of the total forgiveness amount? Um, right now, our calculator has it based on 75% based on of the total forgiveness amount, um, and, that, and that could change. But um, I think we... we we try to take a conservative approach. I think anybody who um, you know need to take it a little more aggressive, you're you're taking that risk that some of it will not be forgiven once the the final uh, rules come out. Um, so we try to build this calculator on a more conservative approach. So it's based on total forgiveness amount. Um, so what this is saying is that to be at that threshold, we should have had payroll five sixty two five hundred. So we're we're technically over. On the non-payroll side, um, this was the this I'm sorry, this should have been the minimum payroll to meet at that 75% threshold. So in this example, we're technically above that 25% um, threshold for non-payroll. So what happens is to get us to 25 um, and 75, we have to reduce our loan forgiveness by $30,000, um, which then feeds into the uh, calculator. So let me go back to the calculator so that way I'm not confusing everybody completely. Um, that $30,000, you know, I'll skip over here real quickly. You'll see this 210, there's a reduction. Um, it goes up to 240, that $30,000, uh, it feeds into this total loan reduction uh, cell. Um, another spot, um, so, so 
we, we spoke of three reductions or three adjustments. Um, we just went through that first reduction, which would be um, the 75-25. The next reduction is the FTEs. If our FTEs do not meet um, what our um, uh, threshold was during that covered eight-week period, um, we have a risk of reduction. So um, this here is linked to the loan, loan forgiveness worksheet. This is your uh, weekly um, calculator you're putting together. So it said, you know, 90 was your average during those eight weeks that you kept employed. And here we said, okay, originally we had a little bit lower and we started hiring back as we had close to that eighth, eighth week. So on average, we had 90 full-time employees. The uh, SBA allows us to choose the better or less, um, more advantageous of your FTEs during two different periods of times. So you can either choose February 15th uh, June through June 30th, 2019, or January 1st through uh, February 29th, 2020, which one ever works better. So if I change one of these inputs, um, so right now, 125 down to 90 is a 28% decrease. But let's say um, during 2019, this number was 110. So now your, your, your percentage decrease goes to from 28 down to 18.2. So it takes the better of the two scenarios. So that's something you want to keep a close eye on. Um, so when you're when you're trying to get back to your FTEs, you, you want to know already what your FTEs were during those two periods of time. So that way um, you can plan better. And then also mentioned was there was that safe harbor, is that opportunity to, 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 to reduce this 28% down to zero. So if my full time employees or equivalents were at February 15th, 2020 were 95, um, and then, you know, at June 30th, 2020, it was 90. I did not uh, fulfill that obligation to bring my FTEs back up to a certain period of time. However, if at June 30th, 2020, I was at 95, you'll see now that percentage decrease. So it was $210,000 hit I had. But now if I hired everybody back up to that amount or number of FTEs I had at February 15th, 2020, if I'm back there, now I'm at zero percent. So that, that's a big um, thing to, to plan for. Um, and that's really the, the whole point of this program was to keep people employed, keep the money uh, flowing to people's pockets. So, um, you know, we don't want to have permanent uh, job loss. Um, the, you know, one question you may have on the FTEs is, hey, you know, some people on my staff, they're making more money now with the unemployment, that $600 extra per week that you get from um, federal there. Um, some of my staff are making more money now than when uh, they were working for me and they don't want to take the job back or they maybe found a different job. Who knows? Um, the SBA did release some guidance on that saying, if you make good faith effort and you show, you can show a trail that you made that offer back to that employee and they rejected it, that actually counts as an FTE. So you made an effort, um, they they didn't fulfill that, uh, or they didn't want to take the job back. It's not a penalty penalty to you, so it's something to uh, you know be aware of. Um, the last adjustment is this individual employer comp reduced by 25% or more. So we have our fourth tab handles this section. Um, here, this is where if you reduce somebody's pay by 25% or more who is making less than $100,000, you get penalized for that. So in this example, we're showing, hey, this person makes $75,000 on the annual, annualized uh, comp rate. Um, this is what we paid them, $5,769 during the eight-week period, subsequent to loan uh, disbursement. On, a, on an annualized basis, this 5769 translates into 37500 And again, everywhere on this on this entire workbook. Blue means input, black means formula. So you would not input anything here. This is just all formula driven. Um, but blue is where you uh, input yourself. So in this situation, 37.5 is 50% of 75,000. It's a 50% decrease. So $2,800 or $2,900 rounded is not forgivable. Um, but then you said, hey, Eric, you know, I don't, I see a zero up in the front. What, what happened here? Well, similar to the FTE reduction, if you restore your wages, uh, their their pay um, at the 215 rate, so the rate at 215 or you know, or $75,000, whatever, um, if you bring them up before 630, 2020, back to that rate at 215, 20, um, then it 
uh, allows you to, uh, you know, have that money forgiven. So if I would have said, no, we didn't restore their wages, so I changed this to no, you'll see this changes to 2084, and on the calculator, uh, rounded up, you know, no sense there, it's 2085. Um, so it's something, again, when you're planning uh, to be, you know, well aware of. Um, and then this down here calculates all the way through, and then says, hey, your total loan forgiveness is $720,000. You know, you, you had cost of 750, you made whole of your FTEs, you had no um, uh, comp below 25% that wasn't restored and your FTEs were restored. The only reduction you had was at 25, 75%. So your total loan forgiveness is $720,000. Um, and that's really the worksheet in, in, in a nutshell. Um, you know, hopefully I didn't lose everybody. I know there's a lot to, to handle and, you know, uh, best recommendation is if you download the, the worksheet, um, play around with it, uh, generate some good questions from there, and um, you know, hopefully, you know, us or somebody else uh, can help you, you know, through the rest. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to Bill. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, everyone. Uh, so what Eric just went through is very important. What I'm going to go through is just reemphasize a little bit some of the situations we've seen, a couple pitfalls to watch out for, and the whole goal of this is to maximize the forgiveness amount. So I'm going to go through a few different examples, and you'll see what changing one factor can really do to the forgiveness amount. So this first scenario, Eric went through all the different categories. So I'm gonna go through them in a little bit less detail, but I want you to focus on one thing, which is the salaries and wages, okay? This is an eight week covered period. It's clear here based on the payroll that the amounts went up as the program continued, right? As the eight weeks went on, we brought back some employees and you can tell that because the salary and wages is significantly higher in week eight. And then, you know, looking above, you need to get that full-time equivalent. As of now, we think 30 hours, but it could be 35, it could be 40. The big key here is we brought people back pretty late in the game, you can tell, because 216 is the average of those eight weeks. So salaries, a couple million dollars there. And then remember, you can include the employer side of the health insurance, the employer side of the 401k, and then the state and local payroll tax. This is one I've seen a few times uh, where there has been an overstatement. So remember, this is not state withholding because that should already be in your salaries and wages. Eric mentioned it, it's really your unemployment insurance and uh, family medical leave in Massachusetts. So we get all those components. And then again, there's gonna be a reduction if anyone's being paid over $100,000 annually. And if you were qualified for any of the other benefits, uh, such as the Paid Sick or Time Off Act, those have to be reduced again. I call that the double dip. So basically, let's just think the most important thing is payroll, and that's 1.9 million in this situation. And as Eric mentioned, you get to add mortgage interest, I think it's actually all interest, uh, rent, utilities. And, and that's kind of like your B category. Your A category is payroll. Let's just focus on that. Everything we can do to payroll, we may not know all the rules, but what we know is they want people to stay on payroll. So focus all your time, energy, making sure that's as high as it can be based on your given situation. If you take the sum of those three, you could see right away if you know, you've know you been inundated and just live and sleep and breathing this calculator like we have, that we have a problem because our other costs are pretty close to our payroll costs. So three million is the maximum amount we could have had forgiven. When we get to the next slide, we'll see some of the pitfalls that greatly reduce this number. I'm not gonna focus much on this. This again is the reduction for employees that have an annualized salary under 100,000. If they're over 100,000, they'd never show up on this spreadsheet. And as we know, the unemployment amounts are, are pretty hefty right now with that extra $600. So if you're making between 50 and $90,000, unemployment might have you around you know, 85, 90% of that amount. So I find it hard to believe we're gonna have a lot of clients with significant people that fall into this category, but just remember if there is a reduction, that's gonna be factored in. Okay, so these numbers are gonna stay consistent with one variable through each example. The most important numbers here are the loan amount, and you can see 
we have a problem. Uh, this is a for PPP. It's pretty poor planning. So if this was your result, you should really seek an, a second opinion because what we have here is a loan amount of almost seven million dollars. And remember, when you calculated the loan amount, you got ten weeks. And when you're calculating your covered period, you only get eight. So yeah, it's the the business payroll is very unlikely to be 100% of the loan amount. But it should be around 75, 80% if you could bring back the employees. Here, it's a very small percentage. So we know right off the bat we got a problem. The second problem here is the amount of employees we have. You see, during the covered period, our average was only 216 employees. And when you take that and test it against the two other periods of time, we're, almost, we're double in most cases. And you could tell from the first slide I went through, we brought a lot of employees back towards the end of June, but it's too little too late. So you have to complete pair the 216 to either the 480 or the 500. Luckily, they let us choose the one that gives us the least amount of reduction. And again, this is an over the top example, just to show the power of, of making sure that we are thinking through what we should be doing. You'd have a reduction of 55% because your employees were you know, more than 50% lower than at either testing period. So now our 3.1 million is going down to 1.7 million. And then you can factor in that $20,000 again because you reduce the payroll by more than 25% on some of your employees. But on top of that, you might be saying, well, there's still another 400,000 that's missing there, Bill. What's the gap? The gap is we didn't use 75% of our costs for payroll. Whether, as Eric mentioned, I think, whether it's the amount that's forgivable or the loan amount, 75%. Either way, in this case, it wasn't close. So we're going to have a third reduction. We have all three of the reductions in this example. Just to summarize the, the really bad impacts here, we, we had a decrease of over 50% of our employees. So that was a major reduction in the forgiveness amount. We didn't have 75% of our payroll 75% of the proceeds used for payroll, so that's the second issue we had. On top of that, we also had the 25% or more reduction in wages, and on a loan of $6.8 million, we're paying back almost $6 million. Huge issues with that. I mean, there's almost no reason that that would be the case because you hit all three of those reductions, it, you would have been better off if you brought people back because it would have increased the 75% threshold, and it also would have increased your employees, which then reduces how much you have to pay back. So this is the scenario that we should not have. Scenario B, what do we do here? Only one significant difference, and it is significant. Our employees went from 216 all the way up to 467 on average during the covered period. So what else went up? Well, payroll went up because we're paying about 250 more employees. So our payroll went up to almost four and a half million dollars. Everything else stayed the same. Now, we don't have 100% forgiveness in this example because our employees didn't quite come back to the full level. The 467 is measured against those two testing periods of 500 or 480. We used the, the smaller amount. So we, we lost about 13 employees, which equates to about 3% of our forgiveness amount. On top of that, we still have the $20,000 because, again, this is one where I don't think we should have it, but we paid somebody maybe $90,000, brought it down to $55,000, and, you know, he really wanted to help out the company, didn't want to go on unemployment. He might have health insurance benefits, or the owners made sure that in the future he's going to be compensated, so he took that reduction. The drastic thing to look at here is the amount of forgiveness. Obviously, the payroll costs went up, so that helps significantly. But again, in the first example, we had three issues. In this example, by bringing up our employees and bringing up our payroll, the only thing we're getting is for the small differential in the employees that we had. And then again, that $20,000 for lowering the wages by more than 25%. So we see that it's not something we just, as we're going along, weeks four and five, we can just bring people back because the magical example that Eric showed earlier, which by the way is, is one area that certainly needs clarification on the headcount, is you bring back those five employees and it got you from 90 to 95 during the testing period between February 15th and June 15th and everything went away. That's great. 
everything goes away as far as you're not going to hit that third guardrail, which is your employee headcount went down, but it's extremely difficult. Actually, it's impossible to have your payroll be high enough to maximize forgiveness if that occurs. So I know some of us could be in weeks four or week five with, with funds, but if any of this is making sense or if it isn't, feel free to reach out. We'd be glad to go through it with you. Uh, in addition to that, before I get to example three, something that did come out a couple days ago, and might have been yesterday, is, is this potential HERO Act, which is another piece of legislation that the House passed, but there is not a sense that it's going to go through in its current form. There's a lot of leniency in that. It's changing that eight-week covered period. It, it might make it 24 weeks. There's going to be some more flexibility, which to us all along made sense if we have these type of businesses that aren't working right now. They're not even in business. So you're employing someone and getting really no value out of it. So I think there could be down the line some favorable changes. And I think that was the reason that they've held off on the final regulations. But right now, we're in week four or five with some of our clients. So it's important to make sure, based on what we know now, we're maximizing that loan amount. Scenario three, we call this the Hail Mary. And the reason, again, is it's re-emphasizing Eric's last example. Our payroll is still back to our first example, though, right? We only have 1.9 million of payroll. Everything else stays the same. Our employees, on average, are still 216. That would be very hard to do, by the way, because if you look at what we have on June 30th, it's, it's 480 now. But this is just for illustration. And it kind of clarifies the point I just was trying to make. We magically bring everyone back by June 30th, and we have no percentage decrease now. We haven't increased any of the payroll costs, right? Because we brought them back June 29th, so it stayed in the exact same amount that we had prior. But look at the difference between example one. And this is where, in my mind, we have the biggest question is on the headcount. Does that really make sense? Yeah, the spirit of the law is certainly to bring those employees back, but Based on what we know now, they could have come back on June 29th, got paid nothing, and then, you know, have a great 4th of July weekend, and you come back on the 10th, and you're laid off. So there's going to have to be some clarification around this. But the key to everything and why we're confident that this tool is great for planning and gives you everything you need to know is if you focus on getting your payroll to 80 to 85% of the loan amount, and you keep your headcount consistent, with one of those two testing periods, you're gonna maximize forgiveness. Because not only does the Hail Mary, you know, it, it, to me, it, I think something might change on the headcount, right? So it's great that they came back and right now that's what it is. But on top of that, you could pay out an extra couple million dollars there, get a much different result. So it, it's not just bringing them back, it's bringing them back timely and making sure that there's effectiveness of their you know, employment, which is why I do think you're going to see some changes to that eight-week covered period. Just a summary there, again, I think I, I touched on most of the bases there. Bringing back the employees is great. You, you don't have the headcount reduction, but you still have the issue with the payroll. Okay, so key takeaways to all three of the situations. Uh, the, I'm not going to go through each and every one of those bullet points, but basically the you can't take the money on a Tuesday and not think about it till next Wednesday. Well, that's basically what I was trying to say is you got to have a plan in place to bring these employees back as soon as you can. Now, I will highlight the second to last bullet because it's not a no brainer. You really do need to look at it, right? Because there are what I call friction costs or what we call friction costs. You know, you might think, well, if I bring them back, everything's forgiven for he or she employee that's coming back. But remember, you're probably paying their health insurance uh, or a portion of it. Workers' comp, you're certainly probably paying general liability. And the ones that you're, you are 100 percent paying is the FICA cost. Right. So that could be 6.2 percent on Social Security when 1.45 on Medicare. So it's not 100 percent free. So just keep that in mind when you're bringing back employees. The last thing I wanted to mention before I turn it over to Dave is, is we have mentioned already, the final regulations were due out almost a month ago. So we are doing the best we can with the situation as it is. And because we've been conservative on the couch. Obviously this is all pending final forgiveness guidance, but the reality of the situation is 
right now, most people are halfway through the loans and we have to make educated guesses based on what's provided, based on the guidance that's been provided to date. So hopefully some of these questions and answers will help you as you map out what you think your loan forgiveness is gonna look like. So the first question we received is, would hazard pay adjustments be allowed? Would it have to go to all employees? If not, are bonuses allowed to select individuals who excel during the shutdown? So currently the only restriction there is now is that in terms of paying employees is that no employee can earn basically 15385 and that's really $100,000 broken out into an eight-week period. As things stand now, there's nothing prohibiting a bonus or a hazard pay within that period. With that said, there may be some restrictions in the final guidance, but as things stand now, that's where we're at. And that was actually defined in the self-employment rules, which there are some clarifications for self-employed individuals that the most you can play an employee over that eight week period. And this is just payroll. This doesn't include retirement contributions. It doesn't include health or the state taxes you pay for them. So the clarification of that is the most you can pay an individual employee is 15,385. Outside of that, there's been no other published restrictions on that. Uh, the next question, will borrowers receive loan forgiveness even if they don't suffer a material detrimental impact from COVID-19 on their business? So yesterday the SBA issued guidance on whether what type of loans they're going to look at to see if there was an economic need for the loan. So based on that guidance, any loan less than $2 million, they say that's a safe harbor and they're not going to look at or review those loans to say that they didn't have a material impact from COVID-19. With that said, there's still some exposure that the other entities could look at it. If the U.S. attorney thinks you made a fraudulent claim and submitted a loan, that's a different matter. But as long as your loan is under 2 million, the SBA is not gonna take a deep dive into it. On the other side of the spectrum is if your loan is 2 million or above, it's subject to review to the SBA to make sure you fit the economic need requirement. What caused that you didn't have access to other markets or you don't have liquidity to keep your company going without this loan. With that said, when they issued this frequently asked question, they didn't really define what the current economic uncertainty is that would satisfy their needs. So it looks like it's going to be a facts and circumstances, but on each individual business. So every everybody above two million should be prepared to have documentation of why they need the loan. Uh, the next question: What exactly does loan forgiveness calculation start? Is it eight weeks from the approval or eight weeks from the date funded to our account? So Eric kind of went over that. It's basically when it's dispersed or when it's funded to your account. So the clock starts as soon as you get that money. So it's eight weeks from that date. With that said, there was, as Bill referenced, the House introduced, the House Democrats introduced a bill that looks like they want to extend that eight week period. But that's not set in stone now, and we shouldn't go off of that. So we should go off of what we know as of now. So you still have to plan on that eight week period. Understand the impact of forgiveness amount if a company does not hire back all employees that were covered under the initial two, two and a half months. It would be helpful to understand any timing or deadline requirements to bring these employees back. So as everything is constituted now, as long as you bring employees back in terms of full-time equivalents as of 6-30-2020, it shouldn't impact you in full-time equivalents. But you'll see what Bill went over, there's other ways that it will impact you. But really, the date to bring employees back on this scenario would be June 30th, 2020. Uh, the next question, require, uh, regarding the full-time uh, employee requirement. Should average full-time for the eight week period be used or is it based on the number of full-time equivalents as of June 30th? So that based on how the legislation sits now, you should use your full-time equivalents as of June 30th, 2020. So if you brought me back by that date, based on the guidance out there now, you should be okay. But with just like what Bill said, there may be something in the final guidance that changes that because if you bring somebody back on the 29th, then you get laid off the following week. Was that really the intent? But as things stand now, you should be using your full-time equivalents as of June 30th, 2020. So somebody asked for some updates from the guidance from when it was first initially issued in terms of the PVP loan. So some of the big things that's changed throughout this whole process is the first thing that comes to mind is that loans greater than two, loans equal to or greater than 2 million will be audited. 
or reviewed by the SBA. Loans under that amount won't be reviewed or by the SBA. There was guidance issued by the SBA how to calculate the loan. So if you're an individual that there's still funding left, if you haven't applied for the loan, uh, there's guidance. SBA kind of lays out how you calculate the loan by any type. It would have been great if this was available April 3rd when most of the applications were submitted. But now there's crystal clear guidance on how you need to calculate that loan on the SBA website. If anybody needs any links, you can shoot us an email. And we can give you a link to that calculation. Uh, another big change is that you should be using gross payroll when you calculate. Initially, there wasn't Initial, the initial guidance indicated that it wasn't gross payroll, but they came back and they changed that, that you use the gross payroll. So whatever whatever you show on your payroll reports is gross payroll, that's what you utilize to calculate the loan. Another big change was they implemented a $20 million cap on all affiliated entities. So if you own four or five entities, the most those combined entities could take out would be $20 million. There are situations where affiliated companies were getting more than that $20 million cap. And that's only effective for loans that came after, and I believe the April 27th was the date where that cap came into play. If you apply for a loan before that rule came out, you're fine. You could have a cons affiliate loans above that amount, but that's something that came in midway through the process. Another big development that was issued by the SBA is that head funds or private equity firms primarily engaged in investments or speculations are ineligible for a loan. So if you were a part of a hedge fund or a private equity firm, you wouldn't be eligible to apply for the PPP loan. In the initial rollout, that wasn't specified. So those firms really should contact their legal counsel whether they should return the money by the, the return date, which was publicized to be May, actually publicized to be May 14th. Now it has been extended to May 18th. That just came out late last night that if there's any doubt in terms of you don't fit the need requirement, you have now until May 18th to return the money penalty free. Uh, the other thing that came out late last night is that if you are a partnership that didn't include the compensation to the partners, because based on the initial guidance, you would really, the initial guidance really spoke to employees in 941s and how you would submit the application. They issued guidance last night that if you're a partnership or an LLC that files a form 1065, you can resubmit your loan to include partner compensation to increase the loan amount. So that's something, if you're a partnership or an LLC, and you did the initial submission without including partnership compensation, so that would be guaranteed payments, any net earnings from self-employment, you can reach out to your lender and you gotta do it quick and say, I wanna resubmit this to increase my loan amount. So every partnership and LLC that didn't submit that has to try to reach out to a lender and do that. It's very important that you can get additional money from the SBA. Uh, the, ne the next question is interest on mortgages. Does that include interest on equipment loans? So the answer is yes, it includes, the interest is gonna be any interest on any real property. So that'd be like a building, a warehouse or personal property. So that includes equipment, vehicles, a copy machine. The only requirement with that is that you have to have this agreement, lease agreement in place before February 15, 2020. So it does include interest on any anything backed by property. So it'll be real or personal property. So some questions around forgiveness that I think we addressed with our calculator. So one is if you reduce an employee's pay by 20%, does it still count towards forgiveness? The answer is yes, it does. As long as you don't cross that 25% threshold, it won't hinder your forgiveness. Um, then in terms of how do you account for payroll employees are greater than $100,000. As things stand now, the only, the most you can include for those employees is gonna be that threshold that I mentioned earlier, it's gonna be 15,385. So that's the most you can include for one individual employee. As things stand now, there's nothing that say you would exclude that employee totally, you, but you could, you're limited on how much compensation for that above 100,000 employee you can include. And that would be the 15,385. Uh, another question came out that, what if I'm paying somebody severance or accrued PTO during this period? Do I count them as an employee? So if you're still treating them as an employee, if they're still on your 941s, they will receive a W-2 year end. Technically, they're still an employee and you would still treat that. There's nothing right now prohibiting severance or accrued PTO, but keep in mind, you still have that limit for an individual employee, that an individual employee won't be able to exceed 15,385 during that eight week period. 
So right now, there's nothing that restricting you to pay out severance because as long as they're going to essentially receive a W-2 from you at year end or be a, a 941 employee through that eight week period, they will count. Next question is, how is the 75% calculated and what can be included and what can't be included? So the most conservative approach is to assume the 75% is based on your original loan balance and that was actually spent for the loan. So as of now, our feeling is you use what your original loan balance is and 75% of that has to be used. Uh, in terms of what qualifies, what you can include as payroll costs. So payroll costs is basically payroll, what you paid your employees up to that eight week period, 15,385 per employee. Then on top of that, you can include the employer portion of health insurance. You can include the employer portion of retirement contributions. And you can also do an employer state and local taxes paid, such as state unemployment uh, insurance tax. Um, and any other state tax you pay on behalf of the employees based on payroll. Uh, the next question is uh, define, uh, definitely define what clarification on full-time equivalent employee is. So people have a question is what's a full-time equivalent employee? Usually the SBA outside of these circumstances, the SBA would define a full-time equivalent employee as somebody who works 30 hours. 30 hours in a week. They don't use the 40 hours, they use 30 hours in that. So that's how you, you would apply that. The other big question that we constantly get to is, should I be using the cash or accrual basis? Basically, we're, there's a feeling that it's gonna be a cash basis. And the reasoning behind that is, if you look at the self-employment rules, they lay out what loan forgiveness looks like in terms of costs and what you can what defines as costs. And in that guidance, it, it basically says, it's based on the amount spent over that covered period. So that would be mean a cash outlay over that eight week period. The other question we get commonly is, can I prepay expenses or load that period right now? So there's still no guidance on that, but I think as a conservative approach, you should have the mindset that it, you could really, it would really cover two months or eight weeks worth of costs. So in terms of rent, you can't pay, it would be aggressive to pay like half a year's worth of rent. Really, they'll probably look at two months worth of rent. Same thing with utilities, same thing with interest. Um, when it comes to also, when it comes to utilities, what's defined as utilities, we've laid it out there for the most part. We think it's water, heat, electric, gas. There's some back and forth where a telephone or internet will be considered a traditional utility. Uh, there's been some things published by the SBA where it's included and some things where it's excluded. So that's really still pending loan guidance. But as a conservative approach for now, when you map this out, I would recommend using just the traditional utilities, which would be an electric, heat, gas, and water for now. One other question that has been asked too is what happens if you don't reach the 75%? Do you miss out completely? Right now, the sense is not, we think it's just reduced. If you don't meet the 75%, similar to the reductions when it comes to full-time equivalent employees, as we reflected in, in the salary, as we reflected in our loan toolkit. I, can't, I know we got some couple more questions from the seminar as we go on, so I'll try to answer. And if I don't get to all your questions, feel free to email us. We'll respond to all the questions with the the best answers that we have if you have a particular situation that applies to you. So one question that came through is, do, does payroll costs include payroll service costs? For example, is fees associated with payroll but not actual wages? So under that situation, it does not include payroll costs. So really, your, your payroll costs are really dictated how you submitted your application because it references, right, how I submitted my application, here are the payroll costs I submitted with my application. In your application, you didn't submit payroll processing fees there. So it wouldn't be part of the forgiveness piece. So now it does not cover, as things stand now, it does not cover payroll costs. Um, some other questions that popped up. Some are real. So any questions that we receive that are specific to a company, I won't go over to that, but I will we'll get back to you on that directly. And I'll go over some other common questions that we receive. Bear with me, I'm pulling it up now. Some other common questions that we receive that all our clients have been asking to this extent. 
So one other popular question is, related to what period, what's your measurement period in terms of reduction in wages? So there's some things out there that you see that, should I be using the 2019 as my base period? Should I be using the previous quarter, which would be Q1 of 2020? Should I be using annualized salaries? Based on how the law is written, there's an inherent conflict. The way it's written, it says you use the previous quarter of Q1 and compare it to the eight-week period. The problem with that is you're comparing a 12-week period to an eight-week period, so it's all going to be an automatic reduction. We think that the, the loan forgiveness guidance, when it comes out, it's going to really solve that. In our loan toolkit, what we think the best approach is and some of the other things that subsequent guidance the SBA has issued, that is we're using 2019 as that base period because you can see in some of the calculation changes when they came out with how to calculate loans by each individual entity type, they always put, they always pointed back to 2019. They used 2019 as a base. There's some thought that you can use a trailing 12 months or you should use the base period of the previous year, it was 2019. They came out with frequently asked questions that either is acceptable, but when they actually issued their guidance, they always referenced back to 2019, using 2019. So that's really been the feeling. So in our loan toolkit, we reflected using 2019 as a base period. If it changes, we'll update it, but we think that's a good guess of what the final loan forgiveness is going to look like. So I've gone through most of the questions. If you have any other questions, feel free to reach out, send us an email. We'll get back to everybody that has a question. We'll respond to you. We'll give you our best guess based on what's out there now. Because like I said in the beginning, we're halfway, most people are more than halfway through using the proceeds and we have to make educated guesses if, if guidance is not coming out anytime soon. So with that, I'll send it back to Brian. Yep, thank you. Thanks, Dave. Um, hopefully uh, this has been helpful information for uh, those of you who attended. Um, as Dave mentioned, um, we will get back to those that have asked specific questions and we'll answer your questions. If um, you would like to take advantage of any of the information described today, please visit the website, bloomshapiro.com and uh, go to the COVID-19 sections um, where you'll find a toolkit. Um, these, these presentations, um, as well as this will be up there soon um, as it was recorded and will be posted to that site. So. Appreciate everyone's time. Hopefully it was useful and helpful to you. And um, everybody be safe out there and thank you for attending. Take care.